Thanks, Reynold, and happy birthday. Happens to be my birthday, my 35th next week. <coughs> so our next presenter, and our first uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Delia Roberts. D Dr. Delia Roberts is gonna speak on nutrition, hydration, and safe movement. Delia Roberts holds a PhD in medical science and a fellowship in sports medicine. She comes from a background in sports science. Her thesis research was the cornerstone of the alt altitude training program used by many of the Canadian uh, top athletes, including numerous Olympic medalists. Over the past 15 years, Dr. Roberts has brought the award-winning expertise from exercise science to the field of worksite wellness by conducting research into the use of physical training and nutritional education for the reduction of occupational injuries and enhanced productivity. So let's put our hands together for Dr. Delia Roberts. at an event like this. It's wonderful to see such a crowd. Um, what you'll find out is that I'm absolutely passionate about what I do. And so um, this is a gift for me because I get the opportunity to stand up here for an hour and tell you about something I really love. And you're not allowed to get up and run out. So you have to listen. Anyhow, um, I've been working in the forest industry for quite a few years. Um, but my, my philosophy about it is that each and every one of us has the ability to grow, as Reynolds said, and giving you the information that comes from this huge body of work in sports science allows me to show you the way to perform like an athlete does. And so I've used this phrase, the occupational athlete. But performance, in this case, is not just a case of staying safe, uh, it's a case of each individual achieving the most that they can achieve. So we all know that we've been working on safety for a long time, right? And we have made a huge difference in the industry. Each and every one of you has obviously made the effort with your employees, with your own life, with your family, to take good care. Oh, where's my presentation? There we go. Okay. So what we're looking at now is finding some new ways to move ahead and keep uh, an advance happening. My background is sports science. I worked for 15 years coaching people like these athletes. And it gave me an opportunity to look at how can you make this individual find the last little bit of percentage inside them. They're already working out for six or seven hours a day. How are they going to add more on to keep their performance moving ahead? When you look at it, each and every individual in the workplace, you have a little bit of a different situation, and yet there are a lot of similarities. For this individual, if he's stronger, if he's more powerful, he's going to be able to do his job better, not just here at work, but to have a life outside that's fulfilled and he's able to enjoy his family and the rest of his life. So the flip side of performance is health. And there are a lot of things that will advance performance that also advance health. But many of us don't believe that anything bad is ever going to happen to us, right? It's pretty easy to say, okay, well, I'm carrying a few extra pounds, but uh, it's not really going to make a difference to my heart and my lungs. So how do you get this person to pay attention to the fact that they're no longer able to get down on the ground and play with their kid? Telling him he's going to have a heart attack in a few days may or may not convince him. But telling him that when he gets in that truck and he drives that truck down the road, he'll be a better driver will grab his attention. So from there, we go into injury prevention because if you feel better, you're more alert, you perform better, and you do your job safer. In the sports science model, as I said, you can't just keep on loading on more work. And that poor driver is already out there for 15 hours a day. So he's not going to come home and put on his running shoes and go down to the gym and work out for a couple of hours, right? What I have to find out is what exactly is it that I can give him as a tool to allow him to perform better. So I want to look at the intensity of the work. How hard does that person actually work on a physical level and on a mental level? Is fatigue an issue? Well, the answer is yes, of course. but how am I going to convince that person that they need eight or ten hours of sleep a night? That's just not going to happen. 
So can I give him some tools that the athletes use to help them manage their fatigue? Do you know that when you interview truck drivers, 75% of them say in the last month there was at least one event that was a near miss that was associated with fatigue. But if you ask them if they manage their fatigue, they all say yes. So those two facts are not compatible. Um, the postures, right? I mean, it's fine for me to say support your back, use the healthy back lifting method, but when I have to carry a heavy object and reach out and be in an awkward posture on an unstable surface, those two things don't really match. And yet, when I look at your body, I can give you the tools to be strong and to be able to withstand that kind of effort without getting hurt. What's the degree of repetition? Each individual movement might not be very challenging, and yet when you do the same movement over and over and over again, it uh, has an impact on your body. And the environmental stressors, right? It's fine to pay attention and see things clearly on a beautiful sunny day. What happens when the sun is shining in your eyes or when it's foggy or when you're cold and you're shivering and you can't really keep your mind focused on the task at hand? And then there's all the extraneous stuff, right? What's going on at home? Do you have enough money to pay the bills? Is your kid okay or is he struggling in school? had an argument with your partner this morning and now you've gone off for two or three weeks and you don't really have good communication. So these things all add to the number of events that we have to process in a day. And when your body is functioning strong, when your mind has the right fuel, it becomes much, much easier to deal with these things and stay stable. And then the last point, right? I mean, I could show up here in my life rough and do my little dance and say, okay, everybody get up and exercise, and everyone's going to say, oh yeah, right. But if I talk to these guys in a language that they understand, while they're out there on the deck in the morning waiting for their ride into the block, then I have a much better chance of showing them how one simple movement in terms of their posture while they're standing here can help protect them for the rest of the day. Does it work? Well, Two Planting was the first group that I ever worked with. And uh, I have to say that there were some folks at Weyerhaeuser that really stood up and put their money where their mouth is. Uh, I was a sports scientist. I'd worked with Olympic athletes. I'd never been in the field. I'd never planted trees. And they said, why don't you come and see what you can do? So 12 years ago, the injury rate there was around 22%. We did a study, because I'm a scientist, I like to measure things, and boom, right away, the injury rate dropped about in half. Um, we did a program, and we started to teach people about it, and we were able to spread that injury reduction rate over, so we saw it throughout the industry um, with a big drop down there to 3%. Then we said, okay, our job is done. We don't have to come back and visit again. We don't have to give you the information again. You already know it. And guess what happens when you stop promoting safety? Boom, came right back up again. So now every year we go out into the field, we talk to tree planters, a quick little visit, spend a day hanging out in camp and chit-chatting with people, and guess what? At the 10-year mark, we had zero recordable incidents in Canadian timber land. That's a huge event, and Weyerhaeuser was able to keep that going for three consecutive years. So if you think about that, impact relative to the industry as a whole, it really does show you that if you do the work, it is totally possible to get to this level, right? Back here, no one believed that we would be able to stop injuries in tree planters. Okay, uh, about four years ago, I did a study with log haulers, and I just want to tell you a little bit about that study so you see the process of where these programs came from. So we had 40 log haulers cross uh, British Columbia and down through the Pacific Northwest. And we followed them uh, for a couple of days to see what the work that they did was and what the impact was on their bodies. So one of the areas where I've done a lot of work is vigilance. And I like to study energy systems. So if I give you the right kind of energy at the right point in time, your muscles will function better. That one's pretty easy to figure out. It actually turns out that your brain and your spinal cord, which are your central nervous system, and then also your peripheral nerves, 
so the, the nerves that carry the information out to your muscle to tell you what to do, but also bring that information back to your muscle through your brain to tell you, oh, I'm tipping over, I need to correct that. So all of those nerve functions require blood sugar to function at their best. Um, this system, which this gentleman is working on right here, is like a little Nintendo video game or something. A light flashes and he has to tap the screen as quickly as he can. And this system actually came from the American Armed Forces, so they developed it in order to measure vigilance in the field. And it's quite sophisticated. It lets me look at anticipation, it lets me look at right versus wrong. I can give you an audio stimulus, a visual stimulus, or a numerical stimulus. So I can look at the different ways that your mind functions. For the drivers, I thought that most of the things that happen are visual, and so we used a visual pattern. It appears on the screen, he has to tap a button. But driving isn't just about reacting, it's about making the right choice. So we made it a bit more complicated. A pattern comes up, it disappears, then some random period of time later, two patterns come up and you have to make a decision. Can I match the previous pattern? If it's the first image that appears, I hit one button. If it's the second image, I hear another button. And if it's not there, I just have to do something different again. So it gets quite complicated and it measures your executive function, how you see information, how you interpret it, and how you make a decision based on that. It only takes about two minutes to run. So I can do that periodically during the day and look at how a person's vigilance or their ability to stay alert and pay attention changes. Okay, so remember that the only fuel that that system can use really is blood sugar. In very long-term starvation, you can adapt. So diets like the paleo diet or the Atkins diet, and is there anyone in the room here who restricts their carb intake? Yeah? So the problem with that system is that this requires sugar in order to function at its highest level. In a very long-term starvation state, you will adapt to burn a byproduct of fat metabolism that's called ketones. And ketones are what makes you sick when you have a hangover. So now I'll ask, does anyone in the room ever have a hangover? Yeah, you know what that feels like, right? So when your brain isn't getting the fuel that it keeps that it needs, you feel nauseous, you can't concentrate, you don't pay attention well, you feel sleepy and fatigued. All of those things are a problem, especially when you're trying to perform at work. Okay, just to remind you, what is a sugar? Sugar is the simplest form of a carbohydrate. Because it's in its simplest form, it really doesn't require any digestion. So it's absorbed from your stomach into your brain very, very quickly. Who chose the cinnamon buns this morning? <laughs> no one's going to put their hand up. So different amounts of sugar in the cinnamon buns than in the muffins and the bread and the scones. Uh, when those sugars are available, they move into your blood almost instantaneously. And because sugar is so important, it's regulated very closely. If you're at rest, as you are this morning, and your blood sugar rises very quickly, you will release the hormone insulin and it moves the sugar from your blood into storage, turns it into fat. And we don't have the enzymes to take it from fat and turn it back into sugar. So it will stay as fat. Now, if this guy goes and runs a marathon, he'll be able to use that to fuel his run. But the problem is, is that his brain and his spinal cord and his reflexes are not ever going to be able to use this fuel again. Now we have to be a bit careful because some things that we think are healthy actually contain almost as much sugar as a candy bar. So one of the educational things is to talk to people about what do you like to eat and how can you satisfy those needs looking at a way that will keep your blood sugar stable. If I can keep your blood sugar stable, I can prevent the fat storage. And boom, guess what? They lose weight. Okay, in the trucking study, I jumped in the truck, drove around with the guys, and every two hours we measured their blood sugar and they did this little um, test for vigilance. The blood sugar test is just like diabetics use, it's just a single drop of blood, only takes a second. We also measured all kinds of other things. So that device is a, a heart rate monitor, but it also includes a very similar recording system as the um, fatigue monitoring watches. 
So it's a triaxial accelerometer and it measures movement in three planes so that I can assess their workload. On day two, we jumped in the truck. They drove a similar route, similar weather, similar conditions. But this time I had this nice bag of goodies and every two and a half hours or so I said, eat this. I didn't ask them if they were hungry. I said, do you want something sweet or something salty? Do you want something crunchy or do you want something smooth? And out of my bag, I produced something that will taste good, uh, but it meets my requirements in terms of stabilizing blood sugar. So the guys were pretty happy about that. They had a lot of fun. The first thing that I found out was that five out of the 40 had serious enough health risks that we required immediate medical attention. A normal fasting sugar runs about five. I had three guys with values over 25. And when I asked them how they felt, they said, oh, I always kind of feel like this. I was like, well, I think we could do something better about that. Interestingly, there was a study that was done in the United States where they set up at truck stops and all they did was measure blood sugar and they got exactly the same percentage of undiagnosed diabetics. What's the problem here? Well, when you sit in a truck all day long, you don't expend very much energy. You might feel very fatigued because the hours are long and your brain is working very hard, but your body doesn't have a very big demand. Um, and the diet really wasn't very good. Everyone recorded what they ate for three days, plus I followed them along and wrote it down to make sure that they were actually telling the truth. So what you find is that the fat intake is about three times what it should be, simple sugars, two to three times what it should be, very high intake of salt, which is problematic for people who carry extra weight, and uh, a very high intake of alcohol. Not a single person in the program was drinking enough water, getting enough fiber, and lots of vitamins and minerals that were low. So big deal, right? I'm not going to have a heart attack because I've lived this way my whole life and my father lived this way his whole life and that's just the way that it is. So this is what reaction time looks like when you're eating the truck driver's diet. And it takes about a third of a second, slightly more than that, to react to an unexpected visual stimulus. So this is straight reaction time. Guess what happens when you stabilize blood sugar? That's about a 15% difference. In some cases, it was as much as three quarters of a second. What's the big deal about that? Well, three quarters of a second is 15 feet of stopping distance at the moderate speed of 50 kilometers an hour and a whopping 40 feet at 90 kilometers an hour. This is an actual two light photo. Yeah, it's pretty interesting to see what happened in the next second, hey? If this guy driving this vehicle has three quarters of a second more to see what's going on, if this guy has three quarters of a second more to see what's going on, do you think he's gonna keep that vehicle on the road? Much, much greater chance of it. This is another graph showing you blood glucose this time. So this was me actually taking a drop of blood and measuring it. And there are three different groups, but it doesn't really matter because they all look sort of the same. This is a more active population. So they came in fasting and they are nice and healthy here. This is a young population, pretty active. Um, then I told them they could have breakfast and mm, those cinnamon buns smell good, right? So blood sugar rises very quickly. Because it rises quickly, we release insulin because they're at rest. And boom, the insulin moves the blood sugar out of the blood into storage. So there are two times during the day where that happens, right? Because here you feel pretty fatigued and so you want to quick pick me up and so you have a Coca-Cola or a candy bar or something. Guess what? I took 5,000 data points. 70% of the injuries were occurring in two hours over a 10 day hour, uh, sorry, a 10 hour day. So that's pretty revealing. And you know what happens? If you get them to stabilize the blood sugar, that drops from 70% down to about 30%. So pretty remarkable change in terms of injuries, only educating people to make a choice about am I gonna have that Coca-Cola or am I gonna have a piece of fruit? Okay, in these two time frames, using my nice little device, I can actually measure a delay in reaction time, an impairment of decision-making, and also a slowing of reflex function. 
So this has big, big impact on the way people respond to uncertainty in their lives. And I don't think there's any question that when you think about the jobs that people are doing in the forest industry, there is a lot of uncertainty associated with it. You can't eliminate what the woman in the car in front is going to do when she answers her phone, right? So uh, having a faster reflex time is probably going to help. Okay, um, this is a study that I did with fallers. It took place in the interior of BC, not on the coast. And over the last year, I've been working more on the coast. So there are some differences. Um, the group was a little bit younger, maybe, than you might expect. And this BMI just tells you that physically, when you look at them, they look pretty fit. These guys work hard. They get dropped by the heli. They climb up the mountain. And so their energy expenditure is pretty high. Um, this particular study was a continuation of one that I was looking at with heat stress that actually started in a plywood and veneer mill in Louisiana. What I was interested in was what happens when people are voluntarily dehydrated. And we say voluntarily because they have that choice of whether to drink or not. But sometimes there are other factors. So as soon as you put PPE on a guy, he's not going to be very effective at getting rid of heat. Because he has physical work, because the outside environment is warm, getting rid of that heat is problematic. He also has to carry everything that he's going to take with him for the day up into the field, and water is heavy. So what's the choice he's going to make, right? Cut short on the water. The work rate that these guys do is actually pretty high. So the, with the heart rate monitors, with the activity monitors, there were six to seven hours of heart rate over 100 beats a minute. Now that might not seem like too much because right now you're probably running around 90 and I'm a little nervous so my heart rate's probably a little bit higher than 90 right now. But um, that's just the average for the day. It doesn't tell you what's going on intermittently. When I look at energy expenditure, what it's telling me is that a good portion of that time is actually spent at a very high rate. So 40% of your maximum oxygen consumption would be like you were jogging, let's say. Um, it costs about 225 kilocalories per hour to do that, and a whopping total of upwards around 1,500 for the day. Now, that's not food intake that's necessary to maintain your weight. That's food intake over and above your daily intake, whatever your baseline is, 3,000 calories or something like that, that is required to just keep your body moving in the bush. Okay, so that's the energy that's needed. Um, the study was a heat stress study. I was told that temperatures are very warm in the interior of BC during the summertime, and look what happened the year that I was there, right? 13 degrees in August, so it really wasn't very warm. But in spite of that, look what's happening with water. So the blue column tells you how much water they drank each day. And it's around two liters, whether you look at June, July, or August. The uh, mauve or purple is the sweat loss. So I actually went in there and collected sweat samples from these guys. And we measured what the average was for the day. So you can see that it's around three liters a day. And as the temperature cooled off a little bit in August, it dropped a bit. But still, it's around three liters. The white column is urinary output. So you actually have to add this onto this to figure out that they were losing about four liters a day and only taking in two liters a day. What does that mean? It means that every month, the amount of fluid that they were losing was equal to about 2% of their body mass. And when that happens, I can again measure a delay in reaction time, impairment of decision making. They all had headaches. And you know what? If I carried the water around and fed them the water, boom, the headache went away. Okay, now what about the diet for these guys? They were living in a camp, and so it was very easy for me to be very accurate about looking at what they ate. Saturated fats, cholesterol, total fat, very high, 80% higher than the recommended intake. Sodium, 100% higher. Alcohol, on the average, five drinks. I, or the equivalent of five drinks a day. Um, so three issues here. Cholesterol, over the three months of the study, 
increased by 10%. So I actually took a blood sample every month and looked at what was going on inside their blood. And this is a blood vessel in a heart. It's supposed to be this big. This is all fat that is inlaid on top of that blood vessel. That's atherosclerosis. You can see that the ability of this vessel to carry blood is severely impaired. Total triglycerides increased by 55%. So three months of living in a camp, eating the camp diet, even though they had such a high energy expenditure, problematic. So it's not just giving calories, it's what kind of calories are you giving the person. Because when you look at their blood sugar, even though they had all that fat and all that simple sugar, look at what happened. So every sample that I took during the day was well below fasting. Every sample that I took showed an impairment of reaction time, an impairment of the ability to assess a visual stimulus, an impairment of the ability to react to an uncertain situation. So how important is that for fallers? Okay, the solution is really quite straightforward. We can improve your concentration, enhance your reflexes, improve your fatigue level, and improve your health, and have an impact on the injuries and accidents. How do we do it? We have to feed our brain, our spinal column, our peripheral nerves, the fuel that they need at the right point in time during the day, and carbohydrates are really the key to that. Every time you do something big, heavy, fast, large, strenuous, you have to burn carbohydrates. Fats are big, complicated molecules, and they take a long time to break down. Right now, you're probably running about 75% fat, but because you're listening to me, because you're processing the information, and also because in order to burn the fat, you have to stoke the fire, carbohydrates are being burned all the time. Uh, certainly, if you're doing anything physically active, you need them to get your nervous system running. Mental reasoning, process that information. How about emotion? How many people here get grumpy when their blood sugar falls? How many people believe that the people they work with get grumpy when their blood sugar falls? <laughs> nice thing is that carbs are easy to digest, right? So it's a simple solution. It's really easy to fix. But we don't store very much, so we have to top it up at the right time with the right fuel, because we don't want to get those spikes in blood sugar. We want to stabilize it. How do you do that? Well, don't skip breakfast. Now, we had a nice breakfast here this morning. Did you try the baked goods? Yeah? How did they taste? Thumbs up or thumbs down? What do I get? I was afraid I might get a mutiny, right? No bacon this morning. OK. Um, how do you do fix it? Eat and drink small snacks every two to three hours. It doesn't mean more food. It means take your normal breakfast and split it up into three portions. Take your lunch and split it up into three portions. And every two to three hours, have part of your lunch, have part of your breakfast. You want to combine complex carbs. So that means whole grains, right? Not just the bread that's colored brown. The reason for that is that when you include the fiber, it slows down digestion. And so even though there's a whole lot of sugar in these items, because you have to break open the cell wall to release the sugar in your digestive system, it takes a bit more time than if you were to drink a glass of even unsweetened juice. Uh, vegetables, great choice. Lots of good vitamins, nice and crunchy, satisfying to eat. They fill you up, but quite low calories. And you know what happens is when people eat like this, they go, oh, I couldn't do that. You know, it's not healthy to snack. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get really fat. Well, you know what? Every driver in the power driving program, and we had 800 drivers across Canada that we rolled it out to, lost weight. Okay, unless you're moving, you need to stay away from the simple sugars. Did the muffins taste okay this morning? Yeah, well, there was very, very little simple sugar in that. Recommendations, include a bit of protein in each snack. The reason for that is the protein is a little bit more complex, and again, it stretches out the digestion time. We also can convert the protein to sugar when we need to. So there is another source of fuel for your brain and your nervous system. It needs to be low fat. 
And we'll talk about that in a minute. In the power driving, in the fit to log program, in the fit to plant program, the suggestions for the meals are presented like this. So you get a green or an amber or a red choice that tells you whether it's good, bad, or really bad. And if it's really bad, we can direct you towards something better. The time frame tells you how long from when you ate it until when that fuel is available to you. So very different situation if you have to get in your truck and drive for two hours before you start work than if you're rolling out of bed half an hour before you have to start uh, lifting things or driving your vehicle. Um, one more issue that we need to take into account when we address it. For the people who are working very strenuously, there's a certain amount of carbohydrates stored in your muscle. This is glycogen, if you've ever heard that term, and the amount that goes into your muscle is fixed. After a day of hard activity, like a faller or a tree planter would do, that amount is reduced by half, and unfortunately we're not very good about getting it back into the muscle. So under normal conditions, we only recover by half. After three days, guess what happens? completely empty of carb in the muscle. You know that really heavy feeling when you're trying to walk up a steep hill or something like that and your legs feel really heavy? That's not fatigue, that's carbohydrate supply. So with the tree planters, what we did was teach them that if you have a high carbohydrate snack immediately after exercise, in fact it has to be within one hour, the enzyme that puts the carbohydrate back into the muscle is a thousand fold more active. So athletes have been using this for many years. This is the whole glycogen deal, the post-exercise sports drink. There's a huge industry that's come up around it. But if I give this to tree planters, boom, I cut injuries in half. As simple as that. So after strenuous work, what do I do? I give them a cookie, like the cookies that you're gonna get at lunchtime, low fat because it's digested quickly and high in sugar at this point in time because I actually want it to go into their bodies. Low fat soup with bread. This is a common practice now in tree planting camps. There's always soup and fresh bread available when the planters come in. Breakfast cereal, ideal, right? You can have your sugar pots because the sugar will move into your muscle almost immediately. The milk has great protein in it and in fact, chocolate milk is the ultimate recovery drink. Okay, so why am I trashing fats? Well, fats are very high in energy. That's okay if you're doing a lot of exercise and you need to burn them. Not so good if you're sitting in a truck for 15 hours. Um, slow to digest and burn. When you have bacon and eggs for breakfast, that fat has to be emulsified before it can leave your stomach. So you know how on your salad dressing, the oil rises to the surface, it separates out. When you shake it, it mixes into little droplets. So that's what has to happen with the bacon before it's gonna move into your bloodstream. It takes three to four hours. And so that is not gonna happen for that full period of time after you eat it. Now there are some very important nutrients in fat. And so we wanna make sure that we do get those nutrients, right? Healthy fats in olive oil, in nuts, and in cold water fish, and here I am in and I won't guess what I had for dinner last night. Um, so you need to be eating that, but the question is when? Do you have time to digest it? And if I eat a high fat breakfast, how long is it gonna take before that fuel is available to me? So we need to make it work, right? At certain times during the day, this is advantageous. At other times, it's not. Complex carbohydrates, Add the grains back in, very important to slow digestion down. Add some protein, you stretch it out into two hours. Add some fat, you're looking at three to four hours. So that's the power driving program. Now you guys can take that home with you. Give it a try. It's pretty easy to teach someone how to do this, but you have to remember that it is your choice, right? What are you going to decide to eat? And why are you gonna eat that? This might feel good right now, but you're gonna have a headache at the end of the day. You won't have the energy to do what you wanna do. And perhaps most importantly, 
that fuel will provide your brain and give you the best ability to make those good decisions. Water has a very similar effect, right? The heat stress study, I did that particular work together with um, all of these groups, in particular the mill workers, and um, the, there was a big study with the fallers as well, looking at the hydration. All of these groups really and truly do have free access to fluid, right? You can make a decision about whether you're gonna drink or not, and interestingly, the average was less than three quarters of a liter of water during the day. That doesn't include coffee, which is a different situation. So every single one of those groups approached the level where dehydration impacts concentration. Do you think that would be important for a physician? Yeah, before I had my knee surgery, I said, did you eat breakfast this morning? Did you have anything else besides coffee to drink? Because I wanted my physician to be making the best decisions possible. For a faller going out in the field, he's just had a brand new baby, important for him to make good decisions too. How do you do it? This is sad, isn't it? Yeah. So the problem with alcohol is that alcohol is dehydrating, and especially when the guys come back into camp and they start drinking right away, um, they are going to be pretty dehydrated by the next morning. All of this research, by the way, has been done with NCAA athletes in the United States. And you know how much beer they drink on average in a year? 40 gallons of beer. Yeah. Um, but they have to train for it, right? When you consume more than the equivalent of four drinks of alcohol, you are dehydrated by about a liter. And that's because the alcohol acts on your kidneys. It impairs your ability to take water up for as much as a full week. So after binge drinking, the risk of injury is increased for the entire week. Now, what do you do about it? You teach people, because I know that there is no way that I am really gonna be able to stop this, right? I can educate, I can talk, but it's part of the culture. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna provide people with the information on the impact of it, and then teach them how to stay hydrated. If they have been binge drinking and they don't want this to happen to them, if I give them the tools to prevent it, it's pretty simple. Most of the time, they're going to actually do it. So the recommendations, stay away from soft drinks, small sips regularly. When you drink a whole liter of water, it moves from your stomach into your bloodstream as a unit, and your body goes, whoa, too much water. I need to get rid of that. But if you drink the water in small sips, it doesn't dilute your blood and it stays in your body much better. Big impact on headache and fatigue. So if I follow a worker around for a day and force him to take a sip of drink every time he stops to put fuel in his saw, at the end of the day he feels so much better that the next day he thinks, hmm, maybe I should have a drink. Um, electrolyte beverages. So the two heat stress studies actually were funded by Quaker Oats through the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, which is an arm's length group that funds research into heat and hydration. So these guys actually swallowed little capsules that measured their core temperature, and we looked at the impact of the heat on their bodies. Certainly in the mill in Louisiana, we had quite a bit more heat than it turned out that we did in um, Revelstoke in the summer. So big heat challenge for these guys, very high humidity, and you can see this is how we collect the sweat. You dry the person's uh, sweat off and rinse it, because we were also looking at salts in the sweat. And then you attach an absorbent pad and cover it with plastic and time a very specific period of time. And we have seven sites on the body that we do this. Plus, they had swallowed the little temperature capsule, so I could walk around behind them and see what their core temperature was based on how much they were sweating, how much they were drinking. Okay, now that's one side of the whole program, the nutrition, the hydration. How do you get people to have the right energy at the right point in time? The other side of it is what goes on inside your muscles and your joints. So this is a knee joint, and you can see that it's a very shallow joint. It's not really a great design. These little things here are the ligaments. They go bone to bone. And they're sort of a little bit stretchy like elastic bands, but they don't really have a lot of tensile strength. So the only way we can support this joint is by layering muscle over top. 
those muscles, the deep muscles, are designed to contract quickly when load increases and stabilize the joint. But previous injury, pain, fatigue, vibration, low blood sugar, dehydration, all of those things impair the way the nerve reacts. Fortunately, it's pretty easy to fix. So at this point in time, I have to ask somebody to be quite brave, right? And would you mind jumping up here and we're gonna do a few little demos. It would be great if it was someone who had back pain because I'm gonna take you through the steps on how to fix that. Anyone willing to come up? Don't be shy. <laughs> I promise I won't bite. Excellent, thank you so much. Let's give the gentleman a hand. Okay, so while he comes up, I'm going to tell you that there are different kinds of reflexes. The muscle stretch reflex responds very, very quickly. When it's working properly, it's only five milliseconds. So let's see how his reaction time is this morning. Quick. Can you stick your arm out for me? Hold it rigid. Don't let me move it. Okay, watch what happens. Excellent. Do you see how when I push, his arm jerks up? So I gave this muscle a quick little stretch and his arm jumped up. Thank you, you can put it down now. Okay, good, so I need to go back to the slides here. You'll see that the tendon pressure is slower. Yeah, awesome, good flexibility. So if I give him a push, <laughs> if I give him a push as I impart force into his shoulder joint, right, his shoulder's gonna tighten up to withstand that force, but it takes longer than the muscle reflex. Still pretty fast. If I give him a big push, right, you jump and land, the force in your knees isn't going to reach its peak until 50 milliseconds. And sadly, if you feel any pain, the game is over, 500 milliseconds. So that's problematic. Now, if these things are working properly, we can avoid this. And so we're going to see whether we can sharpen him up in order to prevent this. In other words, we'll get him to react faster. Okay, so we can stabilize those joints. How do we do it? Well, first of all, we have to readjust his load. So if you look at his spine, <laughs> what I'm gonna do here is help him figure out how to get these little stabilizer muscles to contract before the prime movers. Because if the prime mover contracts first, you can see how it pulls everything off kilter and there's a lot of force on that poor disc inside his lower back. Do you have back pain? No? How many people in the room have low back pain? Yeah, <laughs> it does all depend on what you want to do with it. So we actually want to be able to move and use our bodies, right? Okay, so if I get him to activate his core muscles, it provides a nice solid band around, but now he's gonna hate me because, whoops, sorry, we're also gonna teach him how to activate his pelvic floor and that will really and truly stabilize him. And he's gonna do all this up here in front of you. So first we wanna look and see what his spine looks like, right? Okay, so I'll just get you to turn sideways to the audience and put your arms down at your side. So the normal spine has two curves, right? In the upper back, it's a nice outward or convex curve. In the low back, there should be a nice inward or concave curve. And he looks pretty straight there, right? pretty flat, so we'll just turn you this way and let the audience on this side see. See how there's no curves in his back? The other thing that you can see is that he either drives a truck or looks out a window or works at a desk for a living. You can see where his head is in front of his shoulder. So ideally that would all be lined up and we could take the stress off here. All right, how do we fix it? We only have 10 seconds. So I'm gonna ask him to imagine that there's a string tied to the top of his head and I'm gonna pull up on it. <laughs> so I want you to lengthen through your spine. Okay, can you grow to touch my hand? Oh, look at that, beautiful. Look at the curve here. We have a nice outward curve in the upper back. Do we have a little bit of curve here? Not quite yet, right? So we'll turn you around this way. Just go to your nice relaxed posture. There we go. Okay, if we catch the string to the top of his head and pull up, what happens? Look at that. And now when I put my arm here, He's almost lined up, right? He could come just a little bit taller. There we go. Now we don't want the military posture, which is good that you did that because that's what everybody does. And when you do that, you can't really take a deep breath or rotate very well, right? 
So we need it a little bit relaxed in here, and he's done it automatically, and you can see he has a bit more curve here. So we gotta fix him yet, because this is still pretty flat, and he's a typical male. <laughs> yeah, he's leading with a certain part of his anatomy. I don't know why guys do that. <laughs> As women, we tend to do the opposite, right? We stick our butts out a bit, advertise a little, but it doesn't matter, we can fix it either way. So what you need to do, and we'll do this after lunch, we just get you to check and make sure that your hips are not tilted forward or back. So what I'm gonna get you to do is put your hands on your knees. That's good, and give me a camel stretch. Can you stretch up through here? Hollow in here, yeah, there we go. Doesn't that feel good? Awesome, now go the other way and push here. Stick your butt out, lift your head up. Whoa, oh, no, no, yeah, and push down here. Can you make this flat for me? Stick your butt out. There we go. Okay, other way, stretch up. Yo, camel back. Head down and hollow in here. Yeah, okay, so there is a bit of a difference. Can you see that difference? Now he's sort of rounded here and really stretched up and then he's gonna flatten. Stick your head up and your butt out again. The cat camel thing. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So when he does that, thank you. If you just watch me, right? When I go like this, see how my hips tuck underneath me? And when I do the opposite, my hips tilt outward, okay? So round up, they tuck under, and stick it out, they go the other way. So I'm rocking my hips back and forth. So we're gonna get him to do that now. We can put a little music on too. Stand up for me. Yeah, you're awesome, thank you. Okay. You just stand sideways so they can see your back, okay? Oh yeah, that's right, remember that posture? Okay, that's good. And now, can you just rock your hips a little bit, like a little bit of a pelvic thrust? Remember the cat-camel feeling, forward, back? Yeah, but you need to stay standing up. Yeah, oh, <laughs> he's got it. Okay, stand up for me, stand tall, that's good. And look at his posture now, we have a really nice curve here. So it doesn't take very much to fix it, but I can still move him, right? So if you go to your relaxed posture, just feel this, okay? Can you feel it through here? Yeah, yeah. okay, stand tall, into your toe. Into your push, toe. Well, That's, you push my toe into the top of my runner and it hurts. Okay, that's because I'm so strong, right? Yeah. All right, stand tall. There we go, not in the chest, through the back. There we go, and now I want you to tighten down here. And as soon as I touched it, those deep muscles contracted. Keeping it tight? Does it feel different? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, so the key here is that you have to find that neutral posture first. Because if you don't, when you contract those little stabilizer muscles, you're actually going to increase the shear forces in the joint. And that's one of the biggest problems with core work, is that people forget to teach that if your spine is not in the right position, it's not gonna work very well. So when I'm like this, and I tighten my core, I'm actually increasing the shear forces. If instead I put my spine into neutral, and I tighten my core, now I'm nice and stable and powerful. Okay, so there's the typical male posture, and this is the correct one that we're gonna look for. We'll do it after lunch, everyone together. We find the neutral spine, but then we have to hold it there. So we learn to activate our core. It's very simple to do. Next year when I come back, everyone's gonna have abs like that. <laughs> and last but not least, we learn to activate the pelvic floor. So this one is always a little difficult for me. The first time I did it, I thought, can I actually like say this out loud, that there's a muscle in your crotch and you have to figure out how to work it? But you know what? It's so powerful and it gives you so much strength and it's actually designed to stay contracted 24 seven. And when I teach it to the guys, I tell them this is the same muscle that contracts during orgasm. So if you make it strong and powerful, well, I'll just let you go with that yourself. <laughs> okay, so here's this fellow. In one case, he has a nice ergonomic seat. He tells me, oh, you know what, if, I, if my boss would buy me a new seat for my truck, I wouldn't have an issue with my back. Is that true or not? Look at this low back and think about the two curves. Look at this back and think about the two curves. It looks a lot better, doesn't it? Do you think you need to buy the seat? Okay, shoulder to ear. 
shoulder to ear. Okay? So his head is way out of position, and although you might think that this guy is in a worse ergonomic situation, he's actually better in terms of his upper body than this guy is. All right, so how do you fix it? Here's the cat camel, and again, we'll practice this afterwards. I want to show you this picture, which has nothing to do with your industry, but it's a great one because it's such a clear illustration. So this was uh, at a ski hill, and this gentleman was getting on the chair, and he caught a tip underneath the chair, and it flung him forward, and he hit this post. So we have a cervical spinal injury there. He's a big guy, 260, 70 pounds. He was down in the hole underneath the chairlift, so it was very awkward to lift him out of it, and he's on the spine board. Because of the position, at this point in time, there are only two people carrying the load. This guy is 6'2", 180 pounds, big, strong guy. And look at his back. Can you imagine what that force here is doing to the vertebra, to the disc? This fellow is not much bigger than me, 130 pounds, 135 pounds soaking wet. Look, he's standing on one foot on an unstable surface in a ski boot. Where is the load distributed? Right? So both these guys are carrying a very heavy load. The impact on his back is very different than the impact on his back. Now, he's not thinking about his back right now, but because he's practiced that movement, he goes into his neutral posture, which is where he's supposed to be. And that's how it saves you. It doesn't save you when you're thinking <coughs> posture. It saves you while you're walking in the morning and you slip, right? And the load is transferred properly. Okay, does it work? Well, do you think I can get drivers to actually do this? I don't know. But in the 800 drivers that we looked at, it was very effective. Why was it effective? Because they felt better at work. They actually performed better doing the tasks that they love to do. And believe me, people wouldn't be out there in the woods if they didn't want to be. Decrease in pain, a huge impact on your life. If you have chronic pain, if your neck always hurts and you take that away, all of a sudden you have more energy and attention for other things. And what about your time that you have off, right? Which you don't have a lot of time off, but wouldn't you rather be doing something fun with your family in a positive way? Not being dragged down by these things than in another situation. How do you get more information? This is the Fit Plant program. The whole thing is available on the web. Uh, there's a Facebook page where during the season I post tips and fun videos and recipes and all kinds of good things. And you can download these manuals, courtesy of Selkirk College here, at this address. Um, the Western Civil Culture Contractors Association has started a series called The Desperate Planters. So each year we're doing one more little PDF that you can print out yourself. It's a trifold. So there's one on fitness, one on wrist and elbow tendonitis, and one on the back. Uh, no, sorry, the knee. And this year we're working on the back. Uh, the Power Driving is a program which is designed for people who are not very physically active. So the drivers and the equipment operators. Part of the program is available at the college. These are the two manuals for the Power Driving. And this is the one we have just completed. So this is for the active lifestyle, not just for fallers, but also for forest engineers and chokermen and all kinds of different people. Um, not much of this is available on the web yet, but we are working in that direction. What you can get is download a series of posters. So there's one on hydration, one on staying vigilant. How do you choose what you eat? Uh, looking after your back. And this is the exercise we're going to do after lunch and uh, releasing neck tension. So if we have time after lunch, we'll do that as well. A quick little one for drivers, anybody who looks through a windscreen, anybody who sits at a desk, and also the fallers. Okay, so this is interesting because, because Reynolds spoke about leadership, and I thought, aha, you know what? I put that slide in there too. Because you guys are the leaders, and when you believe in this, it transfers through much, much more clearly. So if you were to have a meeting with your staff and you were to tell them about staying vigilant and eating properly and you serve donuts, 
what kind of message does that send, right? So there I was at one of the trucking companies and I spoke right after lunch and I put up my slide of vegetables and this dude in the front row who weighed 350 pounds made eye contact with me, picked up three of those great big huge chocolate chip cookies, the really greasy ones, and ate all three, right? Building that culture takes some effort and you have to demonstrate that it is going to make a difference. If you're grumpy after lunch, or you didn't eat lunch because you were too busy and too important to take the time to do it, guess what? You're not really showing the people who work for you that there is an alternate. Right? If you value your people, and I'm sure every single one of you values your people, no one wants to go to the family and tell them, I'm sorry, he isn't coming home tonight. Lead by example. I can't demonstrate that enough. If you yourself are not getting some exercise, if you're not eating well, send me an email. I would be glad to help. And I mean that wholeheartedly. It's actually pretty easy to fix if you know how to do it. Um, the guys who work for you are in the bush because they don't want to be told what to do, right? Yeah. So education, how do I educate? By telling them that they'll do their job better if they give this a try. And it takes time, usually about four years, but one person will try it and then Mr. Kudgerman is going to look at it and go, hey, he actually looks better than he looked before. He's smiling today. He's not in pain. What is it that he's doing? And I'm going to try it too. Okay? So it takes a long time. I don't know. I, I actually was driving down the road the other day and I saw um, a logging truck go by and the guy had a uh, bike bungee corded to the front, a mountain bike, and I thought, I need a photo of that, but I wasn't quick enough. All right, according to the people who investigate accidents, 87% of crashes involving truckers stem to some degree from driver error, and the Federal Transport Agency says the same thing, right? Helicopter pilots, uh, airplane pilots. 12% of them were because of fatigue, health, diabetic shock. Um, the insurance companies, and actually this year for the first time I'm delivering some programs to a couple of large insurance agencies, they say that's 25%. So if you could decrease this by 87%, by 25%, that would be very, very powerful. So thank you so much for listening to my antics this morning. And um, let's all make sure that we all go home safe. Thank <laughs> you.